Hi guys. So we are today covering Amazon Dynamo. Um, so the basic question behind um, Dynamo is how to build a base system. which is not acid. Okay, so we want a basically available soft state system that doesn't have strong consistency guarantees, guarantees like acid systems do. Okay, so um, to build a Dynamo or what motivated um, Dynamo was a set of design goals and assumptions. The first one of these and the most important one is that in large systems, uh, failures are frequent. Systems, okay. And that's just one of those things that happen in distributed systems in that if you want to build a system that handles more and more clients, more and more load, well, then you're going to end up with more and more computers that handle user requests. But as you get more and more computers, they start failing. Each computer fails statistically with some frequency. And so um, if you have enough of these computers, your failures are going to be actually quite frequent. Also, as systems get larger, they become more complicated. There's more configuration in the network. So you have different components of the system that can fail to make um, servers inaccessible. And so the data that you store on those servers also inaccessible. Okay. We also have to contend with the cap theorem. And they, the way they approach the CAP theorem is to kind of maximize uh, reliability. Which basically means availability and partition tolerance. Right? So the system has to be up. Um, it has to deal with this connectivity of the network and it has to be available such that requests always succeed. Okay, so what they have to give up to do this is consistency. Um, and they have to give up at least some of the consistency. Okay. Um, that system has to be able to scale. So that's just kind of a given because Amazon wants to handle more and more load. And it also has to be low latency. That requirement comes from the fact that uh, there has been a study about that time, about 2007, where uh, the Amazon has shown how much money they lose for every 100 milliseconds of extra latency. And so what happens is that if there's latency on the Amazon side, people change their mind, come to their senses and don't buy that thing that they don't need. So if Amazon works faster, people are more likely to keep, keep clicking through until they actually check out from um, check out the shopping cart and pay for everything uh, that's in it. So minimizing latency translates to increased sales which is why Amazon systems have to be very fast. Um, okay, so how do they define partition tolerance? Um, basically, there's different kinds of failures that can happen. It could be that the disks are failing, the nodes are failing, the network is failing and disconnecting nodes. It could also happen that data center meets tornado and 
the whole availability zone goes down or you know bunch of servers go out at the same time so in spite of these failures there should be no impact on availability or performance this is a pretty high goal but um, with enough uh, redundancy or with enough replication um, Amazon or Dynamo should be able to to meet those requirements and keep on running okay so instead of building a a database they decide to build a key value store okay so basically if we we can say uh, right or rather in the parlance of uh, dynamo we're gonna have a put Um, and we're gonna put some value, uh, some value. Let's say we're gonna put value with a key, and here's the value that we're storing. Okay, and then to get the value, you will say get, and then you will pass the key, and then you will get back the value. That's a key value store. So there's not a whole lot of structure to this data other than data has keys. Okay, so in terms of the kind of transactions that we've been talking about you would do something like put or you would do a write x with a value of one and then you would read x and then you would get the value of one okay so it's really not that different from what we've been talking um, in the past in terms of the types of components that that transactions perform um, okay so where can that be useful? Well, we don't necessarily have any uh, constraints um, on clients um, in terms of who gets to access what, under what conditions. Anybody can read any data, anybody can write any data. Um, if you're writing two sets of data, if you're writing to X and Y, both of them are not gonna necessarily happen at the same time. It's not like you have a transaction where you know, either X and Y changes value or nothing changes value. You could, have a, you could have a set of operations such that you say write X, write Y, and X succeeds, but Y fails. Well, it's not quite because we're supposed to always succeed, so both of them would succeed, but if there's some other interleaving transactions, it's not clearly clear that we're gonna get to serializability. In fact, we don't guarantee that in this system. Okay, so it's a very um, unconstrained system. Okay, so we're gonna have in here no transactions. Okay. Basically just single key updates. Okay. So you're either changing a value or not changing a value. Um, they also in the paper talk about there being no shared state in the system. Um, that's kind of a weird thing to say because potentially people do share state. So you could build Dynamo for shared state applications where you have some some soft state, um, you know, where someone writes X and someone writes Y. Um, what they really mean is that the applications are built in a way that there is no shared state. So instead of two clients writing to X and Y, we would do maybe something like, um, so no shared state. We would have something where we would do a write and then the key would be, let's say, client one dot X and that would get the value of one and then write um, client two dot X with the value of two. Okay, so basically those are just strings that are keys that identify the variable. The variable isn't X, the value the variable is client two dot x right so there is no shared state even though both of those clients might be operating on some variable x that's kind of local to to their scope okay um, so this makes sense in terms of things like shopping carts right two users can have a shopping cart there could be a variable called shop called shopping cart but the two shopping carts are independent uh, now this gets a little tricky when you're talking about inventory 
right? So inventory could be shared state, but um, you know, what happens if two people try to buy the same thing? Well, it could be that two of them get to buy it at the same time and the one that doesn't, you know, if there was only one item, then maybe the shipping gets delayed or maybe one order gets canceled because it turns out that there is no inventory down the road. Um, could be back ordered, right? There could be different solutions. So at the point where you're making a transaction, you assume there's no shared state and then you do reconciliation at the application layer somewhere, somehow in a way that makes sense for your application like a shopping cart, okay? So um, we also have this eventually consistent state And what this means is that, let's say I'm going to do a write x1, okay? And then I'm going to read x, and maybe what I get back is zero because the value hasn't changed yet. And then I'm going to do a read x again, and now I'm gonna get one, and then thereafter, I'm always going to get one, okay? Unless, unless there's another write to x, right? So this could, this could happen because the, the read and write are going to different replicas. But, so we have here different replicas. But eventually the replicas reconcile. Okay, so um, that's also something that you may potentially have to deal with when building a system based on Dynamo, right? You're not guaranteed to get the, the, the data back right away um, as you wrote it, but eventually the write will take, right? So um, this can be used in production in many systems and it, um, you know, this is one of the examples where you're giving up consistency to have availability where your write can always succeed and, and eventually take an effect. Okay. So, um, I guess this is just, just go, just go back to that example, right? Um, in this case, uh, we have right succeeding right away. Um, such that the right eventually eventually takes. And this is important and kind of different from ACID in that if you're doing a write in an ACID system, well, your write could be delayed some time until it can be, until the transaction can be ordered with other transactions to provide serializability, right? It could be that your write fails completely because your transaction aborts, um, and that kind of gives up availability for consistency. In base systems, in, and in Dynamo specifically, the write will succeed, so uh, there is a confirmation, the client can move on with their, with their life or with their code, um, but the consistency is not gonna be achieved until some point later, if, if ever, right? It's, it's possible that there's a sequence of transactions which, um, so the system never reconciles, but eventually at least your write will be reflected. Okay, so let's take a step back and um, look at how, what is their view of how web applications are built or how cloud applications are built. Well, the way they illustrate it is that you have uh, some sort of users, okay, which then send the requests uh, to some sort of web servers. Right, and those basically take care of page rendering, okay. Then those web servers send requests for their data 
um, two cloud servers. And the first layer of cloud, cloud servers are going to be um, aggregators of requests and load balancers. Okay, so maybe we'll have a couple of those and those servers connect to them. Um, and out of those, we'll get requests that are going to uh, some service handlers. And then out of those, we will actually get access to data stores. Okay, so um, the web servers render the different requests, the aggregators collect requests for backend services or to generate dynamic data that the web servers will render. Um, and then those requests are sent to service handlers, which do the actual logic of what is it th that needs to be computed. So for example, when you're rendering a page for some product on Amazon, there's a whole bunch of data that has to get computed, such as the up-to-date price and, I don't know, data from comments and other things like that. And uh, service handlers will compile the data, but the data itself comes from data stores uh, such as Dynamo, S3, RDS, whatever else Amazon has, right? So what happens in the system is that uh, latency adds up. And if you remember, the goal of Amazon is to minimize the latency of web requests. And so each one of these systems has to be has to be very fast and since everything ends at data everything depends on how quickly data can be fetched um, or written and so this is where dynamo becomes a key a key element okay and when we talk about when amazon talks about latency what they want to minimize is not just the average latency but basically 99th point ninth percentile okay so want to minimize ninety nine point ninth percentile. Okay. The way to understand that is to look at the cumulative distribution function or CDF of latency. or request delay, okay? So if we have something like that, that's our CDF, what we can say, say here is that 50% of requests have latency lower than X, okay? And then we can look at 99, okay? And 99 have latency 99 of requests have latency lower than Y. And so this Y is what Amazon wants to, wants to minimize, right? So basically it's the long tail of latency. There's, it's very difficult to optimize anything kind of, kind of above that or, you know, cause this tail might extend all the way up here, right? Um, but for 99.9 .9 users, they want to minimize this value, okay? Which also minimizes the value for the 50%. Um, in a system. Okay, so that's that's kind of their goal in this. All right, so let's look at how Dynamo is designed, and basically the way they describe it is that's an it's an always. Can't write. There we go. Always writable service. Um, which translates to a strong availability. Okay, so the way they store the data is they arrange all the different keys in a ring. Okay, so the ring starts here and then 
it's just basically a value that goes from zero, zero to whatever is the max value that they allow for the key range. Okay. And so we have some, some key, maybe this is variable x or client one dot x that is stored here that falls here on the ring. Okay. Now those keys or the keys and values are stored by different nodes. So we can have some replica server A and some replica server B and some replica server C and D. Okay. And so those servers have some set of IDs. Maybe this is an IP, maybe this is some other unique ID. And that ID, just like the key, can be hashed onto this ring of values, right? So both the keys and server IDs go through a hash function and that gives them some number which falls between zero and max, right? So you can think of the keys and servers mapping to the ring. Now, this is kind of a common thing in distributed hash tables. Okay, so this is a distributed hash table okay. um, where the keys are stored at the servers on the ring. Okay, so you can, you can think of it as A being responsible for all the keys, storing all the keys and values between uh, a and zero or be between its location and zero and then B is responsible for all the key values between uh, Where it hashes on the ring which is here and where the previous node hashes on the ring which is here So B would be responsible for all those keys between these two dots um, and so on and so forth now what? Uh, what Dynamo does is it actually adds virtual servers onto here. So let's say that this is, uh, we'll call this C, but it's a virtual server, so we'll put it in dots, and this is D. Okay, and so it turns out that A is responsible for everything to zero, C is responsible for everything to zero, D is responsible for everything to zero, and then B is responsible for everything to A, C is res responsible for, uh, and then you can have maybe this is A again. So then, so then this is the responsibility of A, this is the responsibility of C, this is the responsibility of D, okay, and then B would be maybe responsible for, I'll draw it on the outside, D would be responsible for everything to here, a virtual would be responsible for everything to here, et cetera, et cetera. So it kind of overlaps, right? Where even if one of these servers fails, the key and value are stored at some server, okay? So the servers can be placed logically on some ring, but there's also replicas of them, or kind of each server gets multiple IDs. Maybe that's the better way to put it, and it's responsible for some set of keys in different positions on this ring, okay? So depending on how capable each server is, it might get multiple virtual IDs that place it in different points on this ring. Okay. And so each key is replicated on multiple servers. Um, which prevents it from getting lost in case one of these servers fails. Okay. Um, so each write to this, to the system, would be, um, yeah, let me, where should I want to draw it? I'll draw it here. Okay, so each write completed by nodes in a preference list. Okay. So there's some list of nodes for each key. So based on the hash of the key, there would be some list of nodes which is responsible for, for writing this data. And they end up writing this data, they end up uh, forming read and write quorums.
and end up writing data to replicas. Okay, so for example, there's some quorum for changing values of, let's say the key is equal to X, that uh, we would form to write X. Those nodes would form a quorum of whether or not we're writing uh, the data, we need enough nodes to agree, and then we're sending that data to, to the different replicas once, once it has been written, uh, or once the quorum decides. Um, okay, the, the preference list also keeps track of vector timestamps for changes, for data changes. Okay. So as we'll see in a second, Dynamo keeps track of the different versions of the data that are being written. And to keep the, the size of the vector timestamp small, that write is only performed by some preference list of nodes. So not all the nodes in Dynamo, we don't have like a, Dynamo doesn't have this giant vector timestamp that includes all the nodes. Uh, each uh, data key would map to some preference list and then the vector timestamp would only be for those nodes in the preference list so it could be um, smaller right so if a replication level is three then maybe we would have only uh, three nodes in our in our vector timestamp okay so let's look at the process of um, of writing okay so we will have um, we'll do a write x some client will do a write x. Okay. And then let's say that data, that write goes to uh, uh, some, some replica, okay? And uh, we'll have some data item x, x i, and this went to replica a, and the vector timestamp for this is just one. We can just represent it as A1 because all the other vector timestamps for all the other replicas are zero. Okay, so that's our first first version of the data. Um, so basically our key value store is actually key context value store. Okay? So what we are storing here, what this really means is that we're storing we're storing the key, which is X. We're storing the context, this is key. We're storing the context, which is the vector timestamp. Okay. And we're storing the data. Okay. So here in the picture on the left, I'm skipping the data. We're just doing a write uh, to some variable X and um, the, the context of it is A1. So maybe at some point later, there is a, there's another write. Um, so we're changing the data again through a write, and now we're gonna have x2, and this is also going to be at replica two. Okay, um, that's cool, that makes sense. And then maybe we have two other writes um, that are being sent to different replicas, okay? So it's possible that this goes to replica B, and so we have version of x, that's version three, and now the timestamp would be A2, but we're only moving B by one, it used to be zero, and so now we have now we have B1, okay? And we can also have X4 that will be based on A2, but now it's going to have this timestamp also of C1, okay? So what we know from this graph, if we look at the vector timestamps, is that uh, X became X2, but then X2 became X3 and X4 on different replicas. But we also know that X3 and X4 are both based on X2, okay? So if at this point we're going to call get X, okay, the return of this would actually be two different things. We would get one value, we would get uh, X, and then the vector timestamp here would be A2 
um, or I can actually draw it in kind of the, the format we, we're used to, which would be 2, 1, 0, because C is 0. And then we would get some uh, data, I don't know, let's call it D2. Okay. Um, and then we would get also another value or another, um, another data item, which would be 2, 0, 1. Okay. And let's say the data written here was D3. Actually, I'll change the values to kind of match X3 and X4. Okay. So when you're calling get, at this point, you wouldn't just get one value, but because these two writes are concurrent, you would get both of the values, and then it would be up to your application to decide how to reconcile them, right? They're concurrent, so you can take one of them, you can take the other, it's kind of up to you, right? But what you wouldn't get is X2 or X1, because both of those have already been overwritten, okay? So um, at least just move forward. So then we could have... Uh, two things could happen. We could have another write to X, um, or we could have a reconciliation where the replicas talk to each other and figure out, oh, you know, we're actually in a different state. We should try to reconcile those. Um, it might not be possible in this case, right, because they're concurrent, so there's really nothing to, to reconcile. This would only work if someone was behind. But if we have another write, we have another write to X, um, uh, yeah, I'll just draw it here. Okay, so both of these, and then after that write x, we could end up with value x5, okay, where the replicas have talked to each other, they realized, I guess at this point before the write happened, right, so in the timeline here, they would reconcile to realize that there are two values in the system, then we have the write, and then after the write happens, we would get a vector timestamp of um, A2, um, let's say B2 and C1 if that write went to some replica B. Okay, so that would be a new a new value. And at this point, if we did if you did get, you would only get X. Two, two, one, x5. All right, so that's how this works. Um, just a little note on how replicas are reconciled. So It's basically done using Merkle trees, okay? So we have some replica A and some replica B, and they all have some set of values, maybe X, um, 1, Y1, and Z1, okay? And this guy has X2, Y1, and Z1, okay? So they do differ. They need to figure out if they differ, so we would compute a Merkle tree Okay, um, actually we'll compute it based on some empty. Okay, so we can compute some Merkle tree for these. Um, should let me move these A's and B's up. Okay, so we would have some, some root at A and then we would have some root at B and replicas um, A and B could, could compare those different roots to figure out which that their values, the values that they store are different. Here, X1 and X2 are different, everything else is the same, and they could kind of drill down to these Merkle trees to figure out which elements are different and then send those values to each other. And based on the vector timestamps, figure out is X2 actually later than X1? In our example, it was. Or if, for example, we're comparing X3 and X4, where they're well, they are concurrent based on vector timestamps, and so then each replica will store both of the values. Okay. Um, and that basically wraps it up. Um, there's only one kind of 
other thing in here that's sort of interesting it's the failure detection which uh, a node is considered failed if anyone any other node can't reach it okay so in a in a scenario where there are three replicas a b and c and a cannot reach b for example during a reconciliation process a would consider that b has failed but there could be perfectly good communication between b and c and um, those nodes would stay up for, for each other, or both of them would consider each other as being up. Okay? So if A considers B to be failed because it can't reach it, it says, okay, great, I am just going to communicate with someone else um, in, the, in the preference list when handling my operations. Okay? So even if some of the nodes are unreachable, the nodes still try to form quorums for changing data with the other nodes in the in the preference list and if the preference list kind of runs dry uh, it will the system will kind of go to connect with some other nodes to try to form a quorum right and the idea behind it is that if certain nodes fail that's okay we're just going to move on form change quorums based on some other set of nodes and even if we end up with two different quorums right because a just has a really hard time reaching anybody well maybe that's okay we're going to end up with two different versions of the data anyway and then try to reconcile it later on right so we will let data get we'll have kind of quorums to try to protect data from getting from getting messed up try to have consistency of of timestamps but if that fails we're just going to return two different values to the user and they can kind of figure out how to reconcile the data but at any point writes shall succeed right so from amazon's point of view that makes sense right even if you don't have the most up-to-date data they still want you to want to let you complete purchases because that's still going to be a very small percentage of of buyers that maybe use some old value of the price right and so they'll still make money in the long term but if the system starts crashing or being unavailable then they're not making any sales and they're definitely not making money so kind of a different approach but I think Dynamo is interesting to discuss at this point because basically you guys know a lot of this, a lot of the tools that they use in this system. So uh, we talked about peer-to-peer -peer systems and distributed hash tables in 466. So you guys will have seen it there. We talked about Merkle trees already in the context of uh, of blockchains. We talked about quorums. We talked about vector timestamps. So Dynamo is kind of just like a nice conglomeration of all the techniques um, you guys have already used. All right, I hope you enjoyed it and I'll uh, see you guys next week. Enjoy the long weekend.